Hello, White Sox fans. How is everyone doing? Uh, yes, I am back uh, after spending most of the last month traveling. Very happy to be home. And of course, I immediately got sick <laughs> as a result of all of the uh, wearing myself down on the road. So I was just wiped out last week. The only thing I wanted to do was talk White Sox baseball. Nothing else really seemed all that fun. Everything else was a chore. Um, but then uh, I was just two on the floor and... Uh, you wouldn't have wanted to hear me as I was last week. So I'm here today and I was already planning on making a video uh, and then the White Sox really forced my hand because they made a move of their own today. Before I get into the question I was going to ask you all today, hoping that everybody can uh, leave a comment and I will address everybody's thoughts in a future, a very near future upcoming video. Uh, I do have to take a moment to mention that the White Sox made a good bullpen acquisition today. They signed free agent reliever Kendall Graveman. Uh, it's a three-year, $24 million deal. Uh, I think this very directly, specifically uh, fills in the gap that was left when the White Sox released Evan Marshall uh, just a couple of weeks ago. As we all know, the White Sox lost Evan Marshall to injury in the middle of the season. He recovered for a while, went on some minor league injury rehab assignments. Uh, I was really hoping that he'd be back for the playoffs, but clearly there was a much bigger issue at hand. And uh, lo and behold, after the season was over, it was announced that he was going to go under the knife for Tommy John surgery, meaning that he will lose all of the 2022 season. Um, and the White Sox uh, ended up cutting him as a result. Now, there is a, I'd say, a fairly good chance that the White Sox will re-sign him to a minor league deal, but they really just wanted to clear up that 40-man roster spot for, well, players that could contribute this year. Speaking of Tommy John surgery, another reliever that missed all of last year was Mr. Biceps himself, Jimmy Cordero. Uh, he was a guy that had good stuff on occasion, but was not a very overall reliable reliever. Uh, the White Sox ended up releasing him as well. Now, he should be ready to go uh, for the 2022 season. So we'll see. Do the White Sox re-sign him? Uh, do they just let him walk? My guess is yes, because the talent level has risen so highly on the south side including with the addition of Kendall Graveman, who is a very solid reliever and I think would fit into that middle relief role, that later inning middle relief role uh, that Evan Marshall had locked down pretty strongly for the last several years. And of course, this too is a guy with a lot of starting experience. He hasn't started in a few years. And when he was a starter, the results were middling. He was kind of a so-so innings eater type. So I don't think the White Sox will deplore him in that method, uh, but it is good to know that there's one more person on the team that could make a spot start if really pushed into it. Uh, the White Sox still have some moves to make, especially addressing the starting rotation, Carlos Rodon. He was not issued a qualifying offer, which was very surprising to me. If he had been issued a qualifying offer, would he have taken it? I, I guess we'll never know right now. I mean, his, Bor his, his Boris, uh, his agent, Scott Boris, says they absolutely wouldn't have. But really, who knows? Well, I, it's going to be interesting to see what his market is going to be. And uh, we do have some inkling that starting pitching more than usual is going to be expensive this offseason. Uh, we'll get into that right now. The question I wanted to ask all of you, Looking at the holes on the team right now, we've got an opening in right field, we've got an opening in the rotation, and really that's about it. The White Sox are in very good shape overall, uh, but we do have some important questions to answer, and I think it begins, just about begins and ends, uh, on the mound. So the question is, of the players who were issued qualifying offers this year, should the White Sox pursue any of them? So really quickly, a qualifying offer means that there's a free agent out there, but before becoming a free agent, their previous team issued what's called a qualifying offer, which is an average of the top 125 highest paid players. That number this year came out to, I think it was $18.4 million. And uh, that would be a one-year $18.4 million contract if they were to accept it. Brandon Belt of the San Francisco Giants was the only player to do so. Everybody else turned down that number and became a free agent. In return now, if those players signed elsewhere, the team that was left behind, left in the dust by the player, will get some sort of compensation, a draft pick. Uh, also, as a bit of a penalty, the team that does the signing of that now free agent will lose a pick. Exactly how much of a hit would that be for the White Sox? Well, in addition to paying the player their salary, uh, they would also give up their, their second highest pick and have their international signing bonus pool reduced by half a million dollars. I don't know exactly what that pool is 
right now for the White Sox for this coming year. Uh, but for last year, it was about $5.3 million. And we do know that the White Sox have a big signing lined up. I believe this will happen in March of this coming year, of next year, of 2022, uh, with Oscar Colas. Um, it's not official, but there's a reason he is not signed yet. He is the highest rated international free agent. Uh, he could have signed with any team all this year, but it's really strongly believed that he's holding out for the White Sox to be able to make their next round of signings. And of course, he would be the guy that gets a whole lot of money. I have no idea how much of the bonus pool would go to him. It's probably been worked out already to some degree. I don't know if they would have an exact dollar amount, but the White Sox might not have the freedom to be giving up bonus pool money because maybe some of it's already committed. We kind of don't know that at all. Uh, time will tell on that one. So the players who have rejected their qualifying offer and have become free agents now that are eligible to sign with anyone is Michael Conforto, Carlos Correa, Robbie Ray, Corey Seager, Marcus Simeon, Trevor Story, Chris Taylor, Nick Castellanos, Rafael Iglesias, and Freddie Freeman. A couple more guys have already signed. Uh, Justin Verlander was a free agent technically for a little bit, but he ended up re-signing with the Astros on a two-year, $50 million contract. As somebody that is not a fan of the Astros, I am kind of happy about this signing. Uh, Justin Verlander is in his 40s. He is coming off of major surgery, Tommy John surgery. And it's actually a one-year, $25 million deal with a player option for another year and another $25 million, meaning if Verlander comes out and is terrible, he can opt in and get another year and $25 million just added on regardless of how good he is feeling. The team that may be the White Sox biggest rival this coming season, the Detroit Tigers, they made the biggest first splash of the offseason when they signed Eduardo Rodriguez away from the Red Sox on a five-year $77 million deal, another $3 million in incentives. So it could be could be an $80 million deal. As it stands for luxury tax purposes, it's a $15.5 million per year deal. Again, over five years. He he was very good with the Red Sox last year. His ERA didn't show it, but his peripheral numbers showed that he should have had a much better ERA. He, he pitched very well. He was a guy that I was hoping the White Sox would go after. And the final player who has already signed elsewhere was Noah Syndergaard. He left Queens to sign in Anaheim, a very, very different environment. And in the moment when it first broke, uh, it was announced that it was a one-year, $21 million deal. And I thought, gosh, I would have loved for the White Sox to have signed him for, a, for $21 million. And, and then I thought about it more. Uh, Thor, as he's known, is a really, really good player when he is fully healthy. But he is seldom fully healthy. Maybe maybe half of his career, even when he is pitching, he's healthy. Uh, when he's not healthy, he's a pretty mediocre, run-of-the-mill, average starting pitcher. And so not only would the White Sox have to have given up $21 million while being a very risky signing, and the White Sox, of course, like I said, would have had to give up a draft pick and uh, lose some international money. So I'm really happy that the White Sox didn't get Noah Syndergaard. I hope he does well. Uh, he is a really cool pitcher, and you, you hate to see a very talented guy not be able to perform because he's uh, dealing with so many injuries. This is not an, a unique signing for Anaheim. It wasn't that long ago that they signed Matt Harvey, a former ace also from the Mets who had injury issues. They gave him, I think it was a $10 million deal, so much lower. Um, and, and he did not do well for them at all. So I guess you have to tip your hat that Anaheim is finally trying to address their need for pitching, which they just really don't ever do year in, year out. But it was still a very risky signing. We'll see how it plays out. Of the players remaining, I'm going to eliminate a couple off the list right away. Nick Castellanos, very great hitter, great power hitter. However, he's right-handed. We know that the White Sox are looking for a lefty, so I'm going to pull him off the list. Rossell Iglesias, excellent closing pitcher. Uh, the White Sox have so much money already in the bullpen that I don't think they'd have any reason to be going after him. And also Freddie Freeman, it's hard to imagine him not signing back with Atlanta, but at the same time, he's a first baseman. We got first base covered with Jose and of course, Andrew Vaughn waiting in the wings. So that narrows the field down to seven players that the White Sox could potentially sign. Now on this next screen, I'm going to put up what MLB trade rumors predicts that they will sign for. Let's pretend that's the actual offer that the White Sox would have to give in order to try to get these players. If you were the GM for the White Sox heading into the 2022 season, would you make the following offer for the following players? We know that we have a need in the middle infield. There's a lot of middle in infielders here, and we know we have a need at on the pitcher mound. 
there's really only one pitcher left on this list. So leave a comment below which players, if any, you would make an offer to, and I will tabulate the results for a future video. Your options are Michael Conforto, one year and $20 million. Carlos Correa, expected to get the biggest contract of the offseason, 10 years. $320 million, a 32 mil per year average. The only pitcher on the list, the reigning Cy Young winner, Robbie Ray, five years, $130 million, $26 million per year average. Corey Seager, 10 years, $305 million. Marcus Simeon, would he return to the South Side? Six years, $138 million, an average of $23 million per year. Trevor Story, while there is some speculation that he would take a short one-year deal to regain some value, we'll still stick with the MLB trade rumors estimate of six years, $126 million, good for a $21 million per year average. And finally, Chris Taylor from the Dodgers, estimated to get a four-year, $64 million deal, good for $16 million per year. I will again hold back my comments and my opinions just to see what you guys have to say first. And I'll be back here really soon uh, with the results of the previous round of questions as well as this question right here. Do leave a comment, please. Until I see you next, have a great Thanksgiving, and I'll see you very soon.